Welcome Wargamers to the Verdant Forests of the Mortal Realms because today we are taking a look at the lore that came in the most recent two-player box set, Echoes of Doom from Games Workshop. This is the two-player set that recently came out that has a Sylvaneth with the Skaven. Highly anticipated, very excited for both battle tomes for very different reasons, and we'll chat about that towards the end. Uh, but this book is structured a little bit differently. You see, most of these little campaign books that come with these the two army sets have a little bit of lore, and then it kind of goes backwards into missions, and then you get to recreate bits of that lore. So it'll have a complete story, and then allow you to recreate said story with three to four missions. However, this one's a little bit different, and I really do like it. Instead, they give you like three or four pages of lore that tell you essentially why these factions are interacting with one another, and then it kind of pauses. It goes into uh, sort of like a, a timeline thing, like every battle tome has, the Age of Myth, Age of Sigmar, and it's giving you information about the Sylvaneth, the Skaven, and the locations where all of these things are happening. But what's interesting to me is that the lore section in the front is very open-ended, right? It's just when conflict initially begins. And then if you flip through the book to where the missions are, you'll see that each mission has an accompanying page of lore to set the scene for that exact one. What this means is there's actually no canonical ending. We don't know for certain what happens. This is a, a setup to basically introduce two factions to you, give them a reason to fight, and then add lore bits as these battles are going on. It's essentially like a pre-written campaign type thing, but it's really nice because those lore sections for each mission are actually very interesting. It's almost like they took a battle from a black library book and split it up into three sections and, and that's what we get to play. So it's different instead of having like a, a formal lead up and you know we went here and then here and then here kind of a thing, it's much more free form. There's why you fight, and then if you and your opponent want to change the story based on who lived and died, you can do that, which I think is very compelling. And so what I wanted to do in this video is give you the, the sum up of why these two factions are fighting and then have a discussion about them. I'm going to do all of that after a quick word from today's sponsor. Hey friends, I will be very brief, but I know many of us are role-playing game fans in addition to being war gamers, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about a fantastic solo role-playing game series called Legendary Kingdoms. This is a series of books that you can play independently or join their stories together, which takes a varied cast of heroes into a classic pen and paper role-playing game world. Each of these characters have their own skills, strengths, traits, and in-depth character arcs. And all of this is done in a choose your own adventure style with some light, you know, um, like I said, pen and paper role-playing game stuff. Right now, there is a Kickstarter going for the newest entry in this game series known as the Splintered Isles. I have links to a longer description of the game and, and why it's so cool uh, by me in the description down below, as well as links over to the Kickstarter for the newest game. It's a low cost, low barrier entry, fun way to spend several hours crafting a unique adventure of your own. So you can support me by supporting my sponsors and checking out Legendary Kingdoms, The Splintered Isles on Kickstarter. Now, back to the show. Thank you so much for listening to that. Now, our story really begins at a location in Akshi known as Chakrik's Folly. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. I have a Midwest tongue and Skaven names can sometimes be hard for me. But this is a, a giant underworn of the Skaven. It's not their main place, of course, but it's a fortification that they have in Akshi. And we are introduced to a Gracier named Skrittat. And like all Skaven, he is full of ambition and not so much intelligence. And so he has this idea. He wants to join the ruling council of Chakrik's Folly. To do that, he needs to outperform his contemporary, a different Gracier. And what better way to outshine an opponent than to do something that they cannot? So in short, here's the plan. He knows that his opponent, Kreskit, who is the other person that's vying for this council seat, is extremely scared of the Sylvaneth. Now it's not really elaborated on to why, it's just that is a particular foe that this Gracier hates fighting. It could be the ambush tactics, uh, it could be that they just don't understand each other as opponents because the Sylvaneth are so detached from, you know, other living things that they just can't fathom what's going on in their heads and therefore can't plan against them. Or they just have access to magics that Kreskit doesn't understand. For whatever reason, the dude doesn't like Sylvaneth and so, our hero, 
Skritrat has a plan to basically do a raid on a Sylvaneth enclave. His plan is to use a warpstone tunneling to get into the very, very thick of where Sylvaneth enclaves reside in the continent of Neos, or Neos, which is in Gearan, the realm of life. We're going to, boom, pop up right in their home base where they're not expecting us. We're going to steal the largest collection of soul pods uh, possible, and I'll explain what those are in a second, which is very valuable to the Sylvaneth, and bring them back home. Again, to Chakrik's Folly in Akshi. And to do this, he's contracted a ton of people. If you know anything about Skaven Society, I have a whole playlist down below. Uh, basically, they're a whole bunch of like gangs that all work together. These gangs, quote unquote, all belong to separate clans. So there's Clan Scryer, which each one of those is like a, a warlord who's very good at science and he has little lackeys and test subjects below him. But there's different clans that compete under the grand banner of Scryer. So what Gracier's do, being able to move between all of them, is he goes to the various different subclans and hires different aspects of them. So he'll hire drilling machines to be able to use the gnaw holes. He'll go to Clan Verminus and hire a whole bunch of bodies so that he can have soldiers on the ground. He had to go to Clan Mulder to get a rat ogre so that he could actually use the rat ogre to pull the screaming bell. Well, I mean, pull the, the rope for the actual bell itself. The thing is pushed by Skaven, but there's a rat ogre on it. You see what I mean? So he does all of these things and he actually goes to Clan Escher, the assassins of Skaven, and hires one of them as well. Side note here, the story here does a fantastic job of introducing the various clans that this particular Gracier interacts with, chief among which is the fact that it's made very clear this assassin has multiple employers and that it's not too hard to imagine that he would turn on Skrit Rat once the contract has been achieved. So like, he might take a contract from Skrit Rat saying, You're, I'm going to pay you to help us get all these life pods. Cool. Or soul pods. Cool. And then he also might take a contract from Skrit Rat's competitor. Hey, when that mission's over, kill Skrit Rat. And he can fulfill both contracts honestly. He will help them get through this mission, and then he will kill you when it's over. All's fair. Realistically, though, this is just setting up why the units that we get in this box are here. He hired a whole bunch of soldiers. Uh, he got himself a screaming bell, and there's an assassin there. One thing they say about Skrit Rat that I really do like is he actually plucked out one of his eyes and put a like a warp stone eyeball, like a fake one, inside of his head. And even though it causes terrible headaches, it does give him the ability to like perceive magic energy. And I kind of see this as almost like um, heat vision for us in real life, where you kind of get the sense of like the general shape and the aura of something, even if you can't make out the details. But this eye allows him a greater degree of control when he's burrowing through the gnaw holes. Like he's seeing the magic of life magic, or I should say Giran, exuding from this huge, huge repository of soul pods. And so he's able to direct the drilling and they end up, I think, within like 100 meters of their destination, which is like nothing in the grand scope of things. These gnaw holes have been responsible for draining oceans, for destroying things. Like, it'll sometimes, like, just throw Skaven out into the void of space because they're just, it is a literal mining operation. And if you don't know where you're going, you end up lost. Now, the Skaven arrive here. They pop out of their gnaw hole, which actually, this is the first time I've ever seen a good description of what it's like to leave a gnaw hole. Like, what they actually appear as. And I'm actually going to read this little bit here for you because I love it. More than that, they emerged from a hole only a few hundred meters from their intended destination. Sorry, I got that wrong earlier. A hole that was first a glowing green point of light hanging in space, then a crackling sphere, and then, with an awful tearing sound, a rip in the fabric of the realm itself. A tide of furry brown bodies spilt out like filth pouring from an overflowing sewer. And for the first time since they came into being, the heartlands of Neos were defiled. Like, that's a great description of trying to, like, imagine what a gnaw hole erupting is like. But they get there, and uh, obviously clan rats and storm vermin are pouring out. Dryads are coming to fight them. But, you know, it's a lot of surprise, and this is, of course, the last place the Sylvaneth were expecting an attack. But the defenders are doing a fantastic job until the screaming bell rolls out. 
Now the screaming bell is described in a lot of cool ways in this little story, but the big takeaway here is that whatever our little intrepid Gracier has done has twisted the bell to specifically hurt Sylvaneth. Like when he rings the bell, or I should say the rat ogre pulls the rope and the bell rings, the sound that goes out, it first of all, uh, severs the spirit song, which is how the Sylvaneth communicate with one another. So Sylvaneth outside of this situation might know something's wrong and it doesn't feel right back home in the heartlands of Naos, but they can't commune with one another to really explain what's happening. So it disrupts communication on a basic level. But I mean, what that does to them physically, it talks about dryads having like sap blood come out of their eyes, their heads explode, they just collapse, they fall apart. Like it's devastation to them every single time the bell rings. And so because of this, any place where the dryads are trying to put up resistance, the screaming bell just moves that direction and then it's just immediately evaporated. With this, the uh, Skaven clan moves up, they snag a whole heap and ton of soul pods, and they make their way back to Trick Rack's Folly, or at least start making their journey there. In the process, the bell is actually damaged because they're ringing it too hard, and a small chip of it with a little note falls to the ground. Now in response to this, Alariel, who is sensing all this, she has the greatest connection to the spirit song than any other. She would be able to look at it, kind of put the pieces together, she realizes that there's now an attack in their dead center of their homeland, and so she dispatches the Lady of Vines. Because either we need those soul pods back, or, more likely, they're gone forever and we need to exact one hell of a toll upon our enemies for daring to do that. And the Lady of Vines, she's all about spite. Luckily, that little piece of paper uh, that was attached to the bell bit is essentially like maps and schematics for Skitrat's plan. He basically plastered his plan, the details, the blueprints, all of that all over the bell. So if you're looking at your screaming bell and look wondering what you should paint uh, on those little bits of paper that are hanging from it, there you go. But because of this, it's the small clue they need to start chasing down the Skaven. Now, of course, they are in Garan. Chakrik's Folly is in Akshi, and it's said here that the Sylvaneth, generally speaking, do not like Akshi, just because it is a place of heat, dryness, impetuous anger, all these kinds of things, where the Sylvaneth are much more long-livid, they're more calm, more, I guess, tame, I, I was probably the word I'm looking for. So they're like, well, we got a mission into a place we don't like to go fight some people that we really hate. Knowing that the bell is, is especially damaging to smaller creatures like uh, dryads, that kind of thing, the Lady of Vines is like, no, 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 we're, we're arming up. We're going at this full speed, creatures that don't really get affected as much by the bell. And so she takes Kurnoth Hunters, Gossamid Archers, Tree Lords, like the big heavy hitters of the faction. Why the Gossamid Archers are immune, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting, because you would think if they were, she would take a whole bunch of the, uh, the other dryads that are half elf, half tree. But whatever. Now, honestly, that's pretty much where the opening lore story ends. Something has been stolen, right? The, the MacGuffin life pods of doom have been taken by the Skaven, and now the Sylvaneth are going after them. The rest of it, you skip ahead, you read through the various like lore behind the different um, units, and then it gets into the missions. We get realm rules for fighting in the Adamantine Chain in Akshi, which is a chain of islands off the side of it. That's where all this takes place. And what we see are essentially a... a collection of hit and run attacks of the Sylvaneth versus the Skaven. Now, of course, there's nothing dramatic or concrete happening here. These are meant to just be missions to introduce players to the various factions, the game itself, all of that. But we follow the Sylvaneth as they descend down into tunnels to go fight the Skaven there. They chase them all the way up in a mountain, so they fight amongst the peaks and ultimately have one big battle to reclaim all of these life pods. And of course, there's no resolution because that's what you and your opponent are trying to resolve. What we do get, though, is some really cool fight scenes that kind of are tacked onto these missions. So, for example, uh, they are able at last to knock down the Screaming Bell. And the second that that happens, the battlefield changes. Like, Lady of Vines felt a huge surge of power as the Life Song was now being reinvigorated back to her troops. Because even though they weren't dying from the Screaming Bell, it did still sever their connection. So now they feel whole again. And my assumption is we're led to believe that the Lady of Vines was able to reclaim all the various life pods, or at least most of them, and uh, put one heck of a torture session on all of these Skaven. 
Now, why is this cool? Honestly, I like these kinds of things. It's I, I don't cover enough of these small box lore bits just because they typically don't have a very satisfying resolution. I mean, the resolution happens when you and your opponent have a good time playing the game and your dice basically determine the outcome. And you make the story yourself. You fill in the conclusion. But what I can appreciate from here is the basically the time that they took to really give new players to Skaven a grasp of what Skaven are like. We follow this one Grazier as he goes to the various clans, assembles an army for a specific purpose, knowing full well, I mean, it's cited multiple times, all of these Skaven are more than happy to like backstab this dude. It's just about the mission getting paid. They go out there, they do the heist of the century, uh, according to Chakrik's folly Skaven, I guess. And I like that. That was like a good snapshot of the Skaven in sort of a, a vacuum. But in addition to that, I also like the depiction of the Sylvaneth here. Not because it unveils something new to us, but because the Sylvaneth typically in their stories are always very reactionary. Like, they're always trying to reclaim a land that was stolen from them, or they have ambush points set up everywhere and they wait for an opponent to trespass and then they'll attack. But this is one where they got attacked and then on the fly, Alariel assembles a team to hunt them. Like, they are now the active hunters, and I like that a lot. I wish there was more story about them going from point A to point B, how they were hunting down the Skaven. There's not a whole lot of detail in that, but I think it would be very compelling. Especially if they had to do this hunt sort of handicapped. And by handicapped, I mean they're not connected to the Spirit Song, at least for part of the journey because of the Screaming Bell. I think it could be an exceptional short story, at least, to have the Lady of Vines trying to commune and wrestle all of the Sylvaneth together because once the spirit song dissipates like that really does inform a lot of their decision making and their hierarchical structure like she needs to rein them in but you're hunting the thing that's making that happen I just think that would be a cool story to follow so all in all I thought Echoes of Doom was a very fun story I actually love this format even though there's not a, a solid resolution when it comes to taking the time to explain two factions why they're interacting and then follow along some story beats as the battles progress. I, I think the book nailed it. I actually like this a great deal more than some of the older ones. The, the one that I remember the most being like, oh man, of course now I can't remember it, but it's uh, the Vanguard Stormcast and the Nurgle box where it originally came with the wheel forever ago. That set the way that the book was formatted, which was much more of a, hey, here's the whole story with no ending, and then there's missions that kind of go retroactively back to play parts of that story. Whereas this, I like it a lot more. Let's set it up, give me a situation which these two characters, or factions rather, would fight, and then let me resolve it. I think they did great. The missions look wonderful, uh, the artwork inside is, is really cool, and it takes a location in the Mortal Realms and just adds a little bit of like lore behind it. Chick Rack's Folly. Now we know a little bit more. We at least know some Skaven who's from there. And that's rad. I mean, that's all I can ask of these things, because really the whole point of this is just to get new people in the game. But this is a wonderful introduction to the idea of campaign books and uh, war scrolls and that kind of thing. So friends, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Were you excited for the Skaven or the Sylvaneth half of this box? If so, why? I'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.